Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Montgomery County Council. Tonight, we're gonna to have a public hearing on the FY22 operating budget and the FY22 to 27 public services program and fiscal policy and the amendments to the FY22 capital budget and FY21 to 26 capital improvement program for the following. Montgomery County Government, Montgomery College, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, WSSC Water and Montgomery County Public Schools. The council and our committees will conduct work sessions on the budget over the next three and a half weeks, beginning Monday on April 12th, beginning on Monday, April 12th. The full council work sessions will begin in May. The committee schedule is available on the council's website. Ms. Kennedy, if you wouldn't mind, could you introduce the speakers for the public hearing? Good evening, everybody. Some brief directions before we begin tonight. Uh, we do have a lot of speakers this evening and everybody is allotted two minutes for their testimony. We will be keeping time and we are a little bit lenient with the time, but I will have to cut you off if you go too much over. So be ple please be prepared for that. And I'm going to have Lillian Moss translate that in Spanish for our audience. And I also wanted to let everyone know we do have Diana Lavoie with us tonight who will be providing our Spanish translation. Lillian? Absolutely. Um, para todas las personas que estarán rindiendo su testimonio el día de hoy, van a tener un tiempo de dos minutos. Estaremos tratando de darles eh, un poquito más si es que es necesario, pero eh, de extenderse mucho se les cortará el testimonio. Así que lo más aconsejable es que traten de mantenerse dentro de su tiempo de dos minutos. El día de hoy tenemos a la señora Diane Lavoy quien va a estar interpretando a todas las personas. Se les pide que por favor den su testimonio en párrafos para poderle dar tiempo a la intérprete de traducir su testimonio. Susan. Thanks, Lillian. Our first speaker for tonight is Chief Edward G. Sherburn. Chief Sherburn, you will have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin as soon as you're ready. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ned Sherburn. I'm the chief of the Bethesda Chevy Chase Rescue Squad uh, and a resident of Montgomery County. I appreciate the opportunity to briefly summarize our written uh, testimony submitted to the council today uh, about an important budget issue for BCCRS. Bethesda Chevy Chase Rescue Squad has more than 149 active volunteer paramedics, firefighters, and EMTs, plus 29 recruits and candidates. We're managed 100% and staffed primarily by volunteer personnel. As I explained in our written testimony, BCC is requesting that the council increase the FY22 operating budget for the county's central maintenance facility to cover the cost of providing maintenance and repairs for BCCRS emergency vehicles. The county fire chief estimates these costs will be about $150,000 per year. We're not asking for the council to provide funding directly to BCCRS, rather we're just requesting the funds, the NCMF's budget, so it can begin providing maintenance and repairs to our vehicles. CMF currently provides such services to all other local fire and rescue departments. Uh, we're simply asking to have CMS, CMF access on the same terms as the other LFRDs. The fun, this funding is necessary because such uh, repair costs are increasing at an unsustainable rate for BCCRS. In addition, we've lost several sources of revenue due to COVID-19, including rental of our banquet hall facility and increased COVID-19 related expenses. The report is uh, supported by, or excuse me, the request is supported by uh, Chief Goldstein and by the MCVFRA. Uh, we believe BCC is an important and valuable partner in the county's fire and rescue system this funding is necessary uh, for us to maintain our state of readiness and uh, our service to the public. Uh, I remain available to answer any questions and that concludes my testimony. Thanks for your testimony, Chief. Our next speaker is Tara Dunderdale. Ms. Dunderdale, you have ten, two minutes and you may begin your testimony. Good evening, my name is Tara Dunderdale and I am speaking tonight on behalf of Montgomery County DSA. The proposed FY 2022 MCPD budget is a blatant attempt to placate calls for systemic change with a budgetary shell game. This budget increases spending on MCPD overall and gives an additional $6 million to patrol services, the exact dimension of policing that causes the greatest harm to our communities and increases likelihood of violence by police. Increasing funding in FTEs and patrol services is unconscionable and runs directly counter to all evidence of best practices for reducing police violence and the recommendations of the county task force. Trying to hide these increases by eliminating 
eliminating already vacant positions and rebranding existing programs is an insult to the residents of this county, especially our neighbors most harmed by police brutality. We will not fall for your ruse, nor will we accept a mere shuffling of budgets as a reimagining of public safety. Police in Montgomery County only spend 4% of their time on violent crime and only 35% on, on criminal issues overall. H almost half of that time is spent criminalizing social issues like poverty, houselessness, and addiction. Year after year, essential public services are asked to tighten their budgets and do more with less while MCPD's budget continues to grow. We already spend more on policing and incarceration in this county than we do on health and human services. How can you justify giving more money to an organization that already has two thirds more than they need? If this council and executive values our residents' lives, you must reduce the overall MCPD budget for FY22, reduce the number of FTEs and patrol services and department-wide and fund instead programs to serve our communities. Every additional officer you put on patrol is another potential Kwamina Okran, Kevin Koslow, Robert White, Finan Berhe, another child tormented by police, another teenager terrified to walk to school. Every dollar you put towards policing instead of HHS is a family that goes hungry, a houseless neighbor who spends the night in the cold, or a member of our community who dies without access to the medical care they need. Budgets are moral documents. They reflect what we care about. If you do not cut the MC CPD budget and redirect those funds to social services, you're sending a clear message about who really matters to you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Zakia Zankara Jabbar. Z Zakia, you may begin when you're ready. You have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, I'm Zakia Zankara Jabbar, uh, and I am here representing Racial Justice Now, which is a community organization here. Uh, in Montgomery County, and I reside in East County. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for allowing me to be able to speak today and ditto to literally everything that Tara said. I am here to talk more specifically about police free schools. While I appreciate um, Councilman Navarro uh, and uh, County Executive um, Mark Elbert's approach to um, literally just removing the physical police out of the schools, I also am very concerned um, and cannot support the hovering of police officers in so-called community clusters. What we're asking for as a community, many of us in this community and many of the people that you would hear speak tonight is a re, uh, uh, is really police-free schools and really to take the money and redistribute it to care and not cops. People in our community need the support and care that they need. And certainly that is our students as well. Um, many parents, many students across this county have been calling for police-free schools since last summer. And I thank Councilman uh, DeWando and Reamer um, for introducing 4620 uh, to make sure that that happens. However, uh, this amendment is something that I'm imploring all of you not to support. Instead, you could take the money that you're spending on the cops to hover around neighborhoods and actually reinvest that money into restorative justice to make sure and ensure that we have a restorative justice coordinator in every single MCPS school, elementary, middle, and high school. And you can also invest it into culturally competent social workers and other counselors and not cops. That is what the community needs. That is what we literally ask for. And that's what we, I am here specifically to implore all of you all to do tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Joanna Beth Silver. Ms. Silver, you may begin your testimony. You have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Joanna Silver and I'm a member of the Silver Spring Justice Coalition, Tacoma Park Mobilization and Jews United for Justice. All of these groups are part of the Montgomery County Defund and Invest in Communities Coalition. I also served on the County Executive's Task Force on Reimagining Public Safety. Both the Defund and Invest Coalition and the task force call for a harm reduction approach to public safety, and both recognize that the primary way to reduce harm is to reduce unnecessary interactions between police and the public. We have such painful examples, many on video, of the harms caused by police in our county. We saw it once again this morning in Tacoma Park. Abuse, violence, and death resulting when armed law enforcement officers confront members of our community. This council cannot delude itself into thinking that we can train our way out of this and we absolutely cannot throw more money at it. Just yesterday, Chief Jones had the gall to ask for more money because his internal affairs officers cannot handle five or six cases a year. 
This is a division that received a complaint about the abuse of a child by police officers and then waited eight months to interview the officers involved. That so, division does not I deserve a dime more of our yesterday, money. Chief Jones had the gall to ask for more money because he nor should the council give our police department more money to make sure we know what they are doing through robust and transparent data collection. The task force report contains many recommendations that would reduce the need for officers and support a decreased police budget, reducing traffic enforcement and actually ending the SRO program, but also measures like prohibiting pretextual stops, requiring the issuance of citations instead of arrests in citable cases, and ending the time-consuming practice of police officers acting as the agents of private property owners. I ask this council to pass a budget that reduces the harms caused by police by reducing the size of our police force while investing in proactive, positive measures such as affordable housing, good paying jobs, childcare, mental health services, restorative justice, and educational supports. That is what will keep our county safe. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Zali Pineda. Ms. Pineda, you have two minutes and you may begin when you're ready. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Lily Panetta, and I'm a member of Young People for Progress, and I'm here to request that the council allocate funds for more uh, mental health and or restorative justice uh, coordinators in schools, uh, specifically a licensed clinical social worker in every high school. Uh, I'm a first generation Salvadorian American. Growing up, I attended Montgomery County uh, Public Schools and now work for MCPS as a paraeducator at Northwood High School. Uh, mental health services have always been a growing need in our communities, especially now during the pandemic. Uh, students are experiencing increased stressors and therefore need more accessible mental health support. As the data has shown, Black and Brown and low-income communities are at a higher risk of contracting the virus. Uh, this virus has had an inverse, uh, adverse ripple effect on our students who have had to take on more adult responsibilities as a result. Black and brown families who continue to choose virtual learning to reduce their family's risk of contracting the coronavirus continue to get left behind through no fault of their own. Uh, from caring for ill parents, working a day job, or helping their siblings navigate virtual learning, our students are under a lot of pressure and stress and they need specialized support. Licensed clinical social workers uh, meet this need. A few weeks into the start of virtual learning back in April of last year, I called my students' families to help them with their child's school assignments, only to learn that their family's internet or phones were shut off. Uh, I was dismayed and concerned, but kept working. And when I tutor my students, they're often at home with their siblings or extended family's kids, making it hard to have a strong internet connection, let alone a space to concentrate. And I've personally seen students struggle from stress, depression, or overwork before the pandemic started and referred them to our wellness center team with excellent results and they turned around achieving academic success. Many of our students already work to support themselves or their families and I fear many will not graduate but you know who can blame them. I have had students go missing for weeks only to discover that they were painting houses in Baltimore or working at a restaurant kitchen until the morning giving them little to no time to sleep before school and at Northwood we're only one of four high schools in the county that have a wellness center to support our students and their families well-being. Uh, for unemployment, mental health, and more. It's an essential resource. Virtual learning has widened an already large achievement and opportunity gap, exacerbating our schools and with the district pushing for more uh, restorative justice practices, mental health check-ins, and a plethora of all other well-intentioned metrics. Poor schools are left with zero resources to accomplish the monolith of standards the county wants us to achieve. It's Instead of I, making- I'm so sorry to therapists. interrupt. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but your time is up. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Agnes Lesher. Ms. Lesher, you have two minutes and you may begin when you're ready. Good evening, um, I'm Agnes Leshner and I worked in the county for many years in the Child Welfare Agency. I retired and now I'm involved with several nonprofit agencies in the county. And I'm very concerned about our neighbors in need, the people who are struggling to pay their rent, lack of food security, have difficulty finding health care, finding employment. I'm thinking of Sophie, a single mother with two children who lost her job during COVID and has been on the verge of losing her apartment and struggling to feed her two children. I'm here to urge the council to support efforts to provide more low-income housing for people at risk of homelessness like Sophie, 
funding is needed to sub for subsidized housing, for rental assistance, to help people lead productive lives. In addition, many families need help securing food. For example, Interfaith Works opened a food hub three months ago, and they have served 17,000 people in three months who needed food. We also need to expand programs to help individuals who are experiencing unemployment. So vocational programs like the one at Interfaith Works, for example, has 40 people on a waiting list. Those people, if they can find jobs, would not need some of the help that the county provides. I would have one more final request and that's to provide an additional wage for the nonprofit sector. So a 3% increase so that nonprofits can meet the minimum wage. The increase would help um, some of the es essential dedicated staff who serve these low income needy residents like Sophie. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Angela Harvey. Ms. Harvey, you may begin your testimony. You have two minutes. Hello, my name is Angela Harvey. I live in the third council district in Gaithersburg. I am testifying as a constituent and a member of the community advocacy committee at Interfaith Works. As the county prepares for a post pandemic economy, it is important to take steps to ensure an equitable economic recovery for all residents. Here are a few budgetary items I would like to express being in favor of. Working with community partners to end the digital divide to enable residents and students from low income households to have adequate access to computers, technology, and the internet. The targeting of federal COVID relief funding to low income households living in highly impacted zip codes and that racial equity be a priority for vaccine distribution. I am in support of the Housing Justice Act bill in order to take more steps to decriminalize homelessness. A mandatory cap on the percentage of rental increase that landlords can charge. An increase in the maximum rental assistance program grant from $200 to $400. Expanding housing options for the formerly homeless and African-American returning citizens due to the disparity in rates of incarceration and involvement with the justice system an increase in the minimum SNAP benefit from $16 to $30. Inflationary adjustments for HHS contracts to be 3% so that nonprofits are able to pay their staff a living wage. I would also like to express my gratitude and hopes that for, for further funding for the tax preparation services at VITA and the earned income tax credit, both of which I have been a beneficiary of and I know have helped many low income families in the community. Thank you for your time and for hearing my testimony. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Susan Greif. Ms. Greif, you may begin when you're ready. You have two minutes. Thank you for all you do to provide for our community during the COVID-19 crisis. My name is Susan Greif from Imagination Library of Montgomery County, an affiliate of Dolly Parton's Imagination Library. We mail free new age appropriate books to children between birth and age five in five zip code areas, 208-501-20877-20895 and 20903. Despite the disruption of the pandemic, Imagination Library books were delivered without interruption. Our printing and distribution systems were deemed essential services. Our costs remain unchanged, just $2.25 a book, including delivery. We move smoothly from in-person events to all online registration on laptops, computers, or phones with Spanish translation. Two of the 12 books children receive each year are bilingual English-Spanish translation. The books present a rich diversity of people, roles, and cultures. In six years, we have distributed over 33,000 books and 800 children have graduated from the program. Since March of 2020, we distributed over 9,000 books serving almost 800 children a month. We donated 189 books to the Family Justice Center and Safe Passage. In our 2020 parent survey, 60% 
said that our books were their main source of books during the pandemic, and 91% reported that the books were a very important uh, aspect during this time. Another highlight was helping Wheaton Woods Elementary School's PTA launch their own affiliate, working with the principal PTA and the Children's Opportunity Fund. We look forward to continued work to, in order to improve early literacy and kindergarten readiness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker this evening will be Amore Okohima. Mr. Okomila, if you could begin your testimony, you have two minutes. You may begin. You're unmuted. Oh, you need to be unmuted, please, sir. Thank you very much. Good evening, and thank you for permitting me to testify today. My name is Amore Okamina, and I serve as the Administrator of Adolescent Services at the National Center for Children and Families, NCCF, located in Bethesda, Maryland. I am a licensed attorney and child advocate with over 15 years of experience in both direct practice and the administration of child education, child welfare, and human services. My testimony is in support of the council's efforts to address youth homelessness and to further the progress that is already being made in this area. While I am pleased to note that the county has begun to give due attention to youth homelessness, I do want to stress that there is still much important work to be done. Mainly, I would like to emphasize a critical need for more funding and more urgency around this issue. And I would like to ask that this council provide sufficient resources to adequately accommodate the specific needs of homeless youth, youth as we recover from the pandemic. The achievements of NCCF's current and former clients highlighted in their personal testimonies that you heard yesterday, these are but a small slice of a much, much bigger picture. In the last two years, NCCF's Future Bound Transitional Housing Program served 22 homeless youth with 100% of eligible graduates completing high school and 10 youth moving on to securing their own stable housing. What homeless youth need and what we are providing is a transition, not just a shelter. Homeless youth require a developmentally tailored transition into productive tax paying adulthood, a transition to self-sufficiency and economic viability. These young people deserve an opportunity to survive on their own, to support stable families, to create generational wealth. To address these challenges, it is imperative that the council prioritize strategic allocations that advance tailored supports to aid homeless youth in transition, all, across all of our county systems. A one size fit all approach to youth homelessness simply misses the mark. Instead, it constrains their individual ability to be self-sufficient and virtually assures that these disproportionately poor black and brown youth will spend more of their lives being dependent on public systems. My testimony today is in support of the council's funding of interventions that are individualized, culturally specific, economically focused and trauma informed in order to ensure that we divert more youth from homelessness. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Our next speaker is Rachel, Rachel Sierdaski. Ms. Sierdaski, you may begin your testimony. You have two minutes. Hi, um, my name is Rachel Sierdaski and I am a proud member of Young People for Progress. I have lived in Montgomery County my whole life. I would like to call upon the County Council to decrease the Montgomery County police budget and increase funding into resources that support the mentally ill and disabled here in Montgomery County. I was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder when I was 12 years old. I've also been diagnosed with major depressive disorder or clinical depression. In August, 2020, I went through some suicidal ideations. I was going off my medications that I'm supposed to take in order to treat my depression and regulate my emotions. I reached out to a friend about these feelings and what he, he did what he thought was best for me and called the police. I was struggling and I needed an intervention. That same night, three police officers knocked on my door. They had called an ambulance to come take me to Suburban Hospital's behavioral health unit. I was hysterical that night. Being off my meds, I was unable to regulate myself and control my emotions. I was and still am terrified of the police. So the more the police officers interacted with me, the more upset I became. They failed to de-escalate the situation. Eventually, I did get into the ambulance and ended up spending about a week at the hospital. MCPD is unequipped to deal with mental health crises of this nature. They made, it, they made it worse for me that night. The only reason my friend called the police on me that night was because he didn't have any other option. He was worried for my safety because I had expressed my thoughts of suicide to him. This isn't the only time the police have been called on me when I was having a mental health crisis. I support the county executive's budget proposal to fund mobile crisis units made up of mental health professionals to respond to mental health crises instead of police. It's a good first step, but we need even more mobile crisis units than what was recommended. 
to cover the whole county. Hopefully by 2023, that can be accomplished. I also urgently ask that the police budget be decreased. Law enforcement has no place getting involved in this kind of sensitive situation. It should be taken care of by professionals who are adequately trained to do so. Police do not have that kind of in-depth background on mental health. It's time we stopped criminalizing people for what they can't help. I was lucky that I was taken to the hospital that night because that's what I needed. However, there have been times when I've been out in public and had a mental breakdown and police were called. I was at risk of arrest because just, just because I wasn't acting normally. This isn't right and it isn't fair for the many people in this county who are also mentally ill but have the added pressure of being a person of color. Montgomery County needs to invest in more mental health and disability support for its citizens overall. It's Mr. Gatsby, Ms. Gatsby, I'm so sorry, but your time is up. Thank you so much for your testimony. We really appreciate it. Our next speaker this evening is Naomi Nim. Ms. Nim, you have two minutes. You may begin when you're ready. Good evening. I represent the Silver Spring Justice Coalition and lead its mental health committee. We appreciate that the county will soon have three crisis units and maybe three more next year. However, this incremental approach is not commensurate with the urgent need to prevent harm by police against mentally ill residents, just as Rachel just told us, and to provide the best standard of care to everyone experiencing a mental health crisis. Under the proposed level of staffing, mentally ill residents will still be at risk of police harassment and violence when they call for help. Not until the county can assure all residents, especially all black and brown and immigrant residents, that they will be safe from harm in a mental health crisis, will this council have fulfilled its responsibility. As long as police fill the gap in staffing mobile crisis teams, black, brown and immigrant residents will not trust that they can call for help even in dire circumstances. The Silver Spring Justice Coalition urges you to reallocate funds from MCPD to fully fund timely mental health crisis teams 24 seven throughout the county. Invest in a CAHOOTS model that is attuned to the demographics of our county. Hire many more licensed mental health staff that are bilingual and steeped in cultural humility and knowledge. Bring on a core of bilingual peer support specialists and outreach workers, establish a dedicated mental health crisis hotline staffed by bilingual mental health professionals, invest in a multilingual public education program, and develop a crisis response advisory group comprised of impacted individuals. Finally, the mobile crisis team should be thoroughly assessed and all data made public, made available to the public. When police are relieved of mental health duties, lives are saved and costs for policing are significantly reduced. We urge you to commit now to put the safety of all residents front and center and fully fund all aspects of mental health crisis response in the upcoming budget. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Heather Bruskin. Ms. Bruskin, you have two minutes. You may begin as soon as you're ready. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Heather Bruskin and I'm the Executive Director of the Montgomery County Food Council. Thank you, Council President Hucker and the County Council for considering community voice in the annual budget process. The Food Council urges County Council to maintain the significant progress and momentum of the county's pandemic food security response by sufficiently funding continued operations for the many critical direct service food access organizations in our community. In addition, the success of the COVID-19 response efforts has underscored the need for a stable, well-resourced public-private partnership to steward county food initiatives, including grant making, data collection, and community engagement and coordination, all of which will be essential as we establish and implement food recovery and resilience plans. The Food Council stands ready and eager to continue serving in a leadership capacity in, in, in this effort for our county. Similarly, the county should prioritize dedicated food systems resilient staffing within government for policy and interagency coordination and data mapping and analysis. We also need to ensure continuity of county participation in federal and state benefit matching programs like Maryland Market Money and Summer Snap which increase access to nutritious and affordable culturally appropriate foods while investing dollars in our local economy. Addressing transportation barriers, in part through extended free fares on ride-on buses, is another vital component in food security. 
COVID-19 supply chain challenges spotlighted the need for investment in local food production and infrastructure to ensure that we can more effectively leverage the local food supply in future crises. Funding to support small businesses, including our farms and food entrepreneurs, is critical, and as is increased funding for the Office of Agriculture to establish farmer training and long-term land access programs. While we applaud the funding to support community and backyard composting initiatives, training and land access are essential to maximize these opportunities. Finally, we join our voice with the nonprofit sector to urge a total increase of 3% on DHHS contracts to compensate our staff fairly and ensure a continuation of essential services. Thank you for your leadership in building a more equitable, resilient, and sustainable food system in our county. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker for the public hearing this evening is Jillian Copeland. Ms. Copeland, you have two minutes and you may begin as soon as you're ready. You're muted. Sorry. Thank there you. There you Susan. go. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jillian Copeland. I'm founder and executive director of Main Street Connect, located in Rockville. I'm also a longtime proud Montgomery County resident, and I'd like to thank all of you for your time and your energy and your service and hearing the voices in need. I have a few short and sweet bullet points. Um, I hope you will please consider prioritizing relief funds to entities that did not receive financial support in 2020 or 2021. Um, next, it would be helpful if there was a complete transparency, um, if there was complete transparency in relief funds for how they would be equitably distributed within the county and clear communication about the grant process, including timelines. Also some transparency where the, the 300 million, I believe, received due to COVID relief will be going or has gone. Um, please consider creating collective funding initiatives to strategically increase diversity of businesses and nonprofits that are eligible. Focus on funding innovative models that are linked to econ economic recovery and quality of life and hold these organizations accountable to ensure they are positively impacting the quality of life. Um, more specifically, um, to my real health, um, add funding to serve the special needs, including those with mental health issues and those with developmental disabilities in our community. And please consider funding the newbies in 2022 and beyond. We're a newbie. Um, again, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone for being here. I'm so inspired listening to all of the impact that all of you are making in the county and really proud to be a part of this group. So thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Courtney Hall. Ms. Hall, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin as soon as you're ready. Good evening, council members. My name is Courtney Hall and I serve as CEO for Interfaith Works. It is my honor to provide testimony at this hearing today. While we are pleased that some portions of the county executives propose, with some portions of the county executives proposed budgets, we have concerns about others. We strongly advocate for a 3% inflationary adjustment for all DHHS contracts. This will enable us to cover more costs, including paying our staff a living wage. While we are grateful for the recognition from the county executive that our programs remain essential, we do need to flag one issue and raise another for your immediate attention. The first matter, we are very concerned that the contract budget, which allows us to operate our overflow shelters, has been reduced by 40% for fiscal year 22. We are in communication with the DHS, DHHS CEF team about this now and hope that this can be resolved soon. If not, that we may be unable to operate the shelters and as a result, the shelter system could have about 80 fewer emergency shelter beds available for women. The second matter, currently nonprofits are not required to keep pace with the minimum wage schedule, which is defined by Montgomery County legislation. Our county contracts already do not provide funding to cover the cost of doing business. This burden is made worse when we cannot afford to pay a competitive living wage to our most essential employees, the ones who have worked valiantly throughout the pandemic. On Tuesday, I transmitted a letter to each of you, which outlines our grave concerns. I hope that you have received it and will review it. Council President Hucker, I've already heard from your chief of staff who has promised a meeting. I hope that we are able to get an appointment on the books to discuss our grave concern about impact. Our shelter employees should not be able to earn more at Burger King than they do caring for our most vulnerable neighbors. Thanks to each of you for your prompt attention to this matter. Let me also say that we're very pleased at how at the Food Hub's funding continuing, we're currently serving over 500 households every week. It's vital 
and we appreciate that this funding is being considered. Thank you for allowing me to provide a testimony this evening. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Tiffany Jones. Ms. Jones, you may begin when you're ready. You have two minutes. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tiffany Jones, and I'm the chair of the Montgomery County Community Action Board. Thank you for the opportunity to share our board's budget priorities for FY22. The two underlying issues for our testimony this evening are the race-based gaps, biases, and structural racism in our community and the digital divide. Both of these issues play a significant role in the disproportionate impact the pandemic has had on lower income minority communities. We believe that the proposed budget does a great deal to address these inequities and we appreciate these measures. Our first budget priority is the Working Families Income Supplement and VITA free tax services. CAB supports the expansion of the Maryland EITC this year, which raised the state match to 45% of the federal um, EITC. Increase the EITC for single adults and for the first time included people who filed taxes with an I-10. Community Action Agency is the largest free tax program in Maryland preparing taxes for I-10 taxpayers. So we are delighted that the county executive's budget includes $20 million more in to support matching WFIS as it will now equ equitably serve I-10 filers. As, as the budget moves forward to be enacted, we appreciate your assurance to provide a 100% match to serve all who are eligible, and that it continues to be a 100% match and that it can be sustained through the 2022 tax year, aligning with the Maryland EITC increases. Our second key priority is affordable housing. Thank you for your ongoing commitment to renters' rights and increasing the availability of affordable housing options. As the governing body for Head Start, early childhood education continues to be one of our board's main priorities. We appreciate the county executive's inclusion of $5 million in the proposed budget for the Early Care and Education Initiative and hope that the funding will remain so that the initiative can continue its important work. Additionally, CAB supports continuing the basics and endorses county funding for the program. Lastly, our board asks for the council's continued support for its efforts to improve access to services and utilization of a whole family approach that addresses the complex needs of families while engaging them and the community to achieve social and economic mobility. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Gordy Brenny. Mr. Brenny, you have two minutes. You may begin when you're ready. Good evening, this is Gordy Brenny with the Taxpayers League. This budget squanders the 204 million federal rescue on inefficient and ineffective programs, hurting our poorest residents the most while enriching employees with above market compensation increases and fails to fully fund reserves and our employee retirement trust. Also adding 83 positions is an ill-advised use of this one-time funding and increased spending in the face of uncertain revenue projections may require spending cuts next year. Proposed above market pay raises of 4.5% on top of bloated pace, base pay, reduce productivity without corresponding performance improvements and add to the compensation increase the council improved just last month. This insults hardworking taxpayers and squashes fixed income retirees. Poor management, absent incentives, or budgets tied to annual performance improvement targets also reduce productivity. For example, transportation. Nearly empty ride-on buses continue a four-year slump with no ridership projection increases. Public safety. 911 call center response delays and staffing increases are not tied to innovative process improvements. Create a spin-off organization similar to Fairfax's to incentivize performance, innovation, and cost controls. Also, the bloated police investigation division has a mediocre closure rate per employee. MCPS, summer classrooms will be nearly empty with no new interventions tied to achievement gap reduction targets. Hold the budget to MOE and reduce the bloated 45% overhead to increase instruction for at-risk kids. Lastly, WSSC, above market rate increase for this monopoly is largely devoted to replacing lost revenues, not making spending cuts. And there's no public analysis of why sewage and Teleworker consumption shift revenues were lost or how this will be fixed to avoid insolvency in a taxpayer bailout. A record low budget for vital large diameter pipe and large valve replacement is a time bomb. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Lindsay Kuset. 
Ms. Kusa, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you for having me. My name is Lindsay Kusa, and I am in my third year working at Every Mind as a hotline specialist. I previously worked for a suicide prevention hotline in New York City. Every Mind is a proud and engaged member of Nonprofit Montgomery, and we respectfully request a 3% increase to all nonprofit county contracts. Many of you know we provide supportive listening for individuals and crisis prevention. One of our many roles has been lightening the load on county emergency services. For example, in July, I answered a call from a local police officer who, had, who had, was asked to complete a wellness check. He knew he would not be able to get to the individual quickly enough due to a particularly overwhelming Saturday. I sat on the phone with the person at risk for an hour until paramedics arrived. Our hotline helps everyone in our community, from those with minimal financial means and family support to those with ample resources. In October, I spoke to a young man who had lived with severe depression his entire life and had been released from the hospital just a few days earlier after suicide attempt, one of many in his life so far. He had a clear plan to kill himself. I thought seriously about sending the police, but he was adamant that he had no intention of returning to the hospital. Further, he was in quarantine after testing positive for COVID-19. This young man had grown up with every form of support imaginable. It had helped him, but that night it wasn't enough. I was able to de-escalate the situation and keep him safe without involving the police. Our work on the hotline is constantly impacted by current events. This summer, I spoke to a local woman in her 30s experiencing a severe schizophrenic episode. She needed to go to the hospital and was desperate for the police to come, but also extremely frightened as she was black and we were in some of the most intense moments of the Black Lives Matter protests nationwide. I sat with her on the phone until police arrived, guided her on how to answer the door and spoke to the empathetic officer myself to help facilitate a positive interaction. Call specialists on the hotline help keep people out of the hospital, out of police cars, and alleviate the burden on family members and others in the community. Over the past year, the demand for our services has maintained a sustained volume increase of 12%. With this increase, we are still missing 27% of incoming call volume. Our FY22 goal is to meet current community demand by funding the hotline at approximately 1.8 million, which translates to a current funding gap of approximately 1.2 million. We ask for the council's support in closing this Sorry, gap. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We appreciate it very much. Our next speaker this evening is Burke Ermentrout. Burke, you are next. You have two minutes to begin your testimony whenever you're ready. Hi, my name is Burke Ermentrout and I live in Silver Spring. Thank you for taking the time to listen to testimony on the proposed FY22 operating budget. I'd like to focus my testimony on the funding for the Montgomery County Police Department Traffic Division and effective alternatives. It is essential that all residents of Montgomery County feel safe and that the county delivers on measures that actually make Montgomery County residents safer. With regard to traffic, the framework for accomplishing that is Vision Zero and splitting traffic safety responsibilities between MCPD and the Montgomery County Department of Transportation is inefficient and ineffective as we pursue Vision Zero. In particular, as the county increases automated traffic enforcement through cameras, it should decrease the number of sworn officers. The county executive's proposal in this budget to eliminate nine currently unfilled positions from MCPD's traffic division is a good start, but further action is required to align with the recommendations of the Reimagining Public Safety Task Force. As the task force suggests, we should scale up automated traffic enforcement with the purpose of decreasing the number of officers on the road carrying out in-person enforcement. We know that officer interaction with civilians and traffic stops can quickly escalate to a tense or even dangerous situation. So when we have a revenue neutral, effective alternative like traffic cameras, it seems obvious to scale down in-person enforcement and shift to automated enforcement instead. In addition, all collision data efforts should be transferred to MCDOT. MCDOT is much better positioned to identify and implement lasting, effective solutions that address the root causes of traffic incidents, including reducing speed limits and implementing traffic calming designs. Placing a police car on a certain street can act as a band-aid, but we will never reach our Vision Zero goals without real solutions. MCDOT is better positioned to provide those lasting solutions than the MCPD Traffic Division, and this budget should go further to reflect that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Lorna Ford. Ms. Ford, you have two minutes and you may begin when you're ready.
Good evening. My name is Lorna Ford, and I am the chair of MANA Food Center's Advocacy Task Force. MANA's vision is a community where all people at all times have access to good food and welcoming spaces. President Hucker, I want to thank you and all the members of the council for being such important champions of food security. MANA has been able to stay safe and continue serving thanks to the county support, COVID-19 food security task force leadership and the generosity of donors. We are responding to a 40% increase in demand for food services, but have never had to turn someone away for lack of food. This is a testament to our team and to the leveraging of our existing infrastructure as the county's designated food bank. Another hat I wear in the community is as a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. My local chapter in concert with local African American churches helped to ensure that stay put packs of healthy foods reached some of our most vulnerable neighbors last year. MANA's team created a unique offering during a crisis and with the spirit of collaboration among faith groups and civic organizations, we reflected the best of Montgomery County and county support makes these types of connections possible. As an active member of the Montgomery County Food Council, we urge the council to maintain the momentum of the COVID-19 food security response strategy by allocating sufficient fund funding to the Montgomery County Food Council and the many critical food system related organizations in Montgomery County. And recognizing that transportation is a critical issue facing those we serve, we applaud the council's recent efforts in extending free fares for ride on through the summer and we stand with the Montgomery Better Buses Coalition. As a leader and active member of Nonprofit Montgomery, we urge the council to add an additional one and a half percent increase on top of the county executive's recommended increase for nonprofit contracts with DHHS and also provide a three percent increase for nonprofit base budget contracts in all other county departments. At MANA, we know that with investments like these, the county's financial support and a community spirit of partnership, we can face the future and ensure there is food for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker this evening is Laura Mitchell. Ms. Mitchell, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin. Thank you, good evening. Uh, thank you for having us tonight. I am representing the Wheaton Cluster. I'm also the area VP for the Down County Consortium and I chair the Substance Use Prevention Committee and the Operating Budget Committee for MCCPTA. So spinning my hats, <laughs> I'm speaking on behalf of all of those uh, positions and asking you to fully fund, support the county executive's uh, statement that he would fully fund the MCPS budget. We know that our students have had a lot of challenges as have our teachers and administrators this year. And those are not going away as we go back to school. I believe that they'll be amplified, particularly the mental health challenges. We have testified for years and years about increasing our supports for mental health in the school. And this has laid this pandemic has laid bare our dis disparities and our needs. And I fully support this budget, which adds counselors to our schools, it adds psychologists to our schools, and it adds uh, things like community partnerships with Jessa and organizations to help provide mental health uh, supports for our children while they're in school. So I really just ask that you fully support that. There are a lot of great things in there, and. Um, I hope you will. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Emil Parker. Mr. Parker, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin as soon as you're ready. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Oh, great. Good evening, council members. My name is Emil Parker. I'm testifying on funding for the Montgomery County Police Department and the FY22 operating budget on behalf of Tacoma Park Mobilization. Our goal is to reduce the number of unnecessary interactions between police and the community, interactions that have been shown to result in discrimination against people of color, including excessive use of force that can result in serious injury or death. We believe the MCPD budget should reflect this reduction. The police should be focused on responding and prevent, responding to and preventing violent crimes. Other functions wholly unrelated to violent crime, which now take out the majority of officers' time, can be better handled by other parts of county government. The shift with free officers to focus on what should be their priority and reduce the frequency of avoidable encounters that do not promote public safety. As you know, data collected by the, this council's Office of Legislative Oversight confirm that there are significant racial disparities in traffic enforcement, school-based arrests, and the use of force against Montgomery County residents. 
Neither increased training nor other tinkering will eliminate or even significantly reduce these massive disparities, nor is there any need to engage in such a fruitless effort. The Reimagining Public Safety Task Force recommends that the county move to fully or expanded automated traffic enforcement through expansion of speed and intersection camera programs and reduce FTE sworn officer positions in proportion to the time they currently spend on in-person traffic enforcement. Unfortunately, the county executive's proposed FY22 operating budget does not act on this task force's recommendation. Council should remedy this oversight by transferring the function and funding for traffic enforcement from MCPD to MCDOT and greatly expanding automated traffic enforcement to the extent permitted by state law. Task force also recommends eliminating SRO programs and shifting the funding to youth counseling and development programs. County executive is apparently proposing to convert SROs to CROs who would still be a regular presence in schools. Such tinkering is misguided. There's no need for police. However, they are labeled to be walking a beat in our schools. Council should pass expedited bill 4620 and reject bill 721, which is a cosmetic non solution. Funding for SROs should be removed from the budget and transferred to the Department of Health and Human Services for the provision of mental health and counseling services for students to enable MCPS to meet the recommended student to mental health and counseling staff ratios. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, sir. Our next speaker this evening is Jarvis Slacks. Mr. Slacks, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you're ready. Thank you. My name is Jarvis Slacks and I've been an English professor at Rockville campus of Montgomery College for nine years. I am one of three vice presidents of the full-time faculty union, the AAUP. Last year, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the faculty at Montgomery College were expected to create remote versions of our face-to-face -face classes. Many faculty members lacked the proper training and equipment. Faculty council counselors had to come up with a mechanism to provide remote counseling and advising services for our students. We also had to deal with the stress of trying to protect ourselves and our families from a deadly virus. Many of our students were experiencing similar stressors. Some of them didn't own a computer at the start of the COVID crisis and had no internet access at home. Our students had to study and learn under difficult circumstances. A number of our students and members of, the fam of their families contracted the virus and students amazingly still managed to attend and complete their classes. In spite of the challenges, we did what we could to help our students financially. The full-time faculty donated $150,000 of our EAP funds to the Student Emergency Fund to help students who could were not eligible for CARES Act funding. For the past year, we have continued to adapt, serve, and educate our students. Now we need you to do your part and support our administration's FY 2022 operating budget request. We have educated many current county employees who are going to get a raise next year, police, firefighters, healthcare workers, and teachers. They are the very backbone of our community. Despite the increased workload, adapting courses, adapting services, as well as dealing with the personal stresses and sacrifices we experience, we have agreed to no increase in salary for next year. And let me repeat, while other county employees negotiate an increase in salary for next year, we agreed to no increase in salary for next year. We hope that this sacrifice and degree of cooperation is recognized and appreciated by both our administration and the county because we will be asking and expecting an increase in salary for the full-time full -time faculty for the 2022-2023 academic year. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker this evening is Link Hoeing. Mr. Hoeing, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin. Members of the council, our community appreciates the approval of the major construction project for a new Poolsville High School. We believe two critical elements of the plan for the school have been left out. Without them, we believe the plan is deficient. The current plan does not include a new competition sized gym that can meet all current and future needs. Our school has as many and in some cases more student athletes than other major larger school high schools. Our current gym is nearly 50 years old. It cannot accommodate crowds for major games like playoffs. We need and deserve a new gym. We also believe the plan must include a wellness center. If the current pandemic has taught us anything, it is that student mental health has suffered tremendously over the last year. The county itself recognizes this and MCPS even approved a pilot program focused on helping students who have suffered during the pandemic. A major state report in 2018 showed that even then, a large proportion of students suffered from mental health problems. Our school is 10 miles or more from virtually all county services and mental health support programs. We need this center. The Fair Access Committee, as you know, was established to ensure that the Western County receives fair treatment and how county programs and capital investments are made. 
We appreciate the approval of a new high school, but our experience shows that attention is rarely paid to the needs of our area, and we need to finish the job of making our high school, our high school building work for all students. The commitment from the overall CIP budget for this proposal is tiny, only eight thousandths of a percent of the $1.7 billion budget, but the impact it will have on Western Montgomery County is huge. We appreciate your support and commitment to fair access for the western portion of our county. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker this evening is Christopher Saka. Mr. Saka, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin. Good evening, members of the Montgomery County Council. It is an honor to speak to you tonight. My name is Christopher Saka and I attend Montgomery College at the Rockville campus. I'm a lifelong Silver Spring resident. I'm here tonight to ask you to support Montgomery College's operating budget request, which will keep tuition affordable for students like me. At MC, I am a student senator, a member of the Macklin Business Institute Honors Program, and a business major during my freshman year. After completing my associate's degree, I plan to transfer to a four-year institution to earn a finance degree. I am proud to be the first person in my family to attend college. I hope to use my education to work for an international organization like the World Bank. I chose to attend MC because of the college's affordable tuition. Like many of my fellow students, without MC, I would not have been able to pursue a degree. College would have been out of reach for me. Now more than ever, MC students are in desperate need of keeping tuition affordable, or many will have to cut their college aspirations short. Due to the pandemic, many of my peers are in much greater need as they have lost their jobs and are unable to pay rent or even buy groceries. MC has worked tirelessly to help students with emergency financial aid laptops, and food. With your continued support, the college can keep meeting the needs of its students. It can keep tuition affordable. Thank you for your long-standing support for my college, which has ensured that countless students can pursue their passions and has empowered the next generation of leaders in our community. We need your continued help. I ask you to please help support MC's operating budget request so that students like me and those I represent can afford the education they need. Thank you for your continued support in my home Montgomery College. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Michael DeLong. Mr. DeLong, you may begin your testimony. You have two minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, members of the council. My name is Michael DeLong from the Montgomery County Young Democrats. Thank you for hearing our testimony. We appreciate all your work on the budget for 2022. And the COVID-19 pandemic is hopefully going receding, but its impacts are still being felt and the least fortunate among us have been very hard hit. We urge you to use the budget to assist them. Uh, the 6.7 billion budget is an excellent step toward this goal. Uh, we're very pleased that it fully funds the Board of Education's request for 2.8 billion and has 312 million for Montgomery College. We also strongly support the additional programs to help low-income people, especially the extra $20 million for the Working Families Income Supplement Program. That's going to double its budget and provide much needed support to people who are very, very low income. We're also pleased about the lens of racial equity. And the budget proposal also includes a bunch of promising measures to protect the environment, additional staff for climate change protection, vehicle and building electrification, and community outreach. But it is not enough. Climate change is a huge problem and it grows more serious with every passing year. We need stronger measures to rapidly shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy and more investment in public transportation. The housing crisis is another serious problem. We're glad that the budget is taking steps to address that by providing 61 million for the housing initiative fund. Uh, but we also are going to need more housing in general as more people move into the county and our population grows. We also strongly support more mobile crisis teams. We think that police, except in very dangerous circumstances, should not be the first responders in these cases and that public health and mental health professionals should always be available. Uh, we would also like to repeat that police shouldn't be involved in schools except as a last resort. So we think that the whole SRO program should ideally be eliminated for better programs and student advocate professionals. Uh, finally, we understand that 203 million is going to be given to the county from the American Rescue Plan. We urge you to use this aid to make more investments that will result in long-term benefits for Montgomery County and all its residents. We also thank County Executive Elrich and their staff for the work on this and uh, contact us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Olga Balcazar. Señorita Olga Balcazar, uh, puede presentar su testimonio, por favor. 
Señorita Balcázar, por favor. Okay. Yeah. Eh, buenas noches, miembros del Consejo. Primero quiero agradecer la oportunidad que se me ha brindado desde este momento frente a ustedes. ¿Continúo o trasla hacen la traducción? <risa> Eso que voy a, tra voy a traducir ahora, pero luego haga párrafo por párrafo o como quiera. Good evening, members of the council. Um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity that has been given to me to testify here. My name is Olga Balcázar. I've lived in this county for many years. Sé que este condado hace muchos esfuerzos por nuestra comunidad y vivimos agradecidos, pero quisiera pedirles que se considere en el presupuesto de contratación de más organizaciones latinas. I know that this county has made many efforts in our community and we're grateful. However, uh, I'd like to thank that thank I'd like to ask that in this budget we include funding for Latino organizations to provide mental, physical and emotional health services to our Latino population. Especialmente en estos momentos que se se que se está viviendo debido a la pandemia. Espero que se considere mi petición. Especially in these days when we're all dealing with this pandemic, I hope you'll consider my request. Nuevamente quiero dar las gracias a todos ustedes por su, su preocupación por nosotros los, los residentes. Somos muy bendecidos de vivir en este hermoso condado. Gracias y buenas noches. Again, I want to thank you, all of you, for your concern about uh, we, the residents, we're very blessed to live in such a beautiful county. Again, many thanks and good night. Thank you for your testimony. Muchas gracias por su testimonio. Our next speaker this evening is Crisia Gomez. Ms. Gomez, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Tiene dos minutos para empezar su testimonio. Comienza cuando esté lista. Buenas noches, respetables miembros del Consejo. Mi nombre es Crisia Gómez. Good evening, honorable members of the council. My name is Crisia Gómez. Vivo en la ciudad de Rockville por muchos años. I've lived in Rockville for many years. Quiero aprovechar esta oportunidad para compartir ante ustedes. I want to take this opportunity to share with you las preocupaciones que tenemos algunas personas que estamos solicitando ayuda. The concerns that some of us uh, have who are requesting help. Para el pago de alquiler de vivienda. For our rental assistance. Teniendo en cuenta que actualmente las listas de espera cada vez son más largas. Taking into account that the lists, the waiting lists for this help are getting longer and longer. Y el número de personas que solicitan esta ayuda cada día aumenta más. And the number of people requesting this help is growing by the day. Sabemos que se está haciendo esfuerzos por ayudarnos. We know that efforts are being made to help us. Pero necesitamos que se agilice de manera más eficaz. But we need this help to be provided more quickly and efficiently. También quiero preguntarles. I also want to ask you. ¿Qué planes tiene el Consejo para ayudar a la comunidad más vulnerable? What plans does the Council have to help the most vulnerable community? ¿Qué ha sido afectada por la pandemia? Who have been affected by the pandemic. Cuando finalice la ayuda por pagos mor morotarios de vivienda. When this housing uh, assistance ends. Eso me preocupa porque muchos residentes serán desalojados de sus hogares. This worries me because many residents will be evicted from their homes. Muchas gracias por la oportunidad y buenas noches. Many thanks for this opportunity and good evening. Thank you for your testimony. Gracias por su testimonio. Our next speaker this evening is Sandra Rodas. Sandra Rodas. Puede dar su testimonio. Yes. Um, buenas noches, estimados miembros del Consejo del Condado. Good evening, honorable members of the uh, County Council. 
Thank you for this opportunity that's been given to me to testify before you. Mi nombre es Santa Rosa y soy madre de familia y residente del Distrito 4 por muchos años. Uh, my name is Sandra Rodas. I'm a mother and I've lived in District 4 for many years. Quiero agradecer al concejal Nancy Navarro y a todos los miembros del consejo, pues nuestro distrito um, se ha modernizado y ha mejorado mucho en los últimos tiempos. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Council Member Nancy Navarro and the members of the council because our district has been modernized and it's a lot better. Pero quisiera que consideraran desarrollar más programas de deporte donde los niños y los jóvenes participan y que puedan canalizar su energía en actividades deportivas. However, I'd like to ask you to consider developing more sports program so that children and youth participate and are able to channel their energy into the sports activities. Sé que existen programas de deportes y organizaciones que los promueven, pero es necesario que estén uh, accesibles económicamente para muchos de los residentes, pues en estos momentos los niños y los jóvenes necesitan más actividades de recreación. I know that there are, there are sports programs and there are organizations that promote them, but we need these to be economically more accessible so that more youth can participate in these activities, recreation and sports, to avoid the stress that they find themselves in because of isolation caused by the pandemic. Eso ayudará a aliviar el estrés en el que se encuentran debido al aislamiento debido a la pandemia. Muchas they, gracias. They are under a lot of stress because of the isolation caused by the pandemic. Many thanks. Thank you so much for your testimony. Gracias por su testimonio. Our next speaker this evening is Patricia Asituno. Señorita yes. Patricia. Muy buenas noches, honorable miembro del Consejo. Quiero dar las gracias por la oportunidad, más que oportunidad, el privilegio que se me ha brindado. Good evening, honorable members of the council. I want to thank you for the opportunity, more than the opportunity, the real privilege to testimony, to give testimony. Mi nombre es Patricia Seituno. Soy participante de las clases cívicas en la Escuela Element Elemental South Lake, residente de Montgomery Village desde hace muchos años. My name is Patricia Aceituno. I'm a participant, excuse me, I'm a participant in the civic classes at South Lake Elementary School. And I've lived in Montgomery Village for many years. Esta noche, quiero llámese abogar, representar o alzar la voz por los adultos mayores, sobre todo los que residen en la parte de arriba de nuestro condado. This evening, I'd like to uh, advocate for and get your support and uh, raise my voice for the seniors, especially those that reside in the upper part of our county. Sabemos que existen programas para personas mayores, pero quisiéramos que en nuestra área existiera un centro similar a Holiday Park, pues este centro realiza muchas actividades que benefician la calidad de vida de nuestros residentes mayores. We know that there are programs for seniors, but we would like there to be in our area a center similar to Holiday Park, because that center carries out many activities that benefit the quality of life for our Older residents. En nuestra área existen muchas personas mayores que se encuentran muy solo, especialmente en nuestra comunidad, comunidad latina. In our area, we have a lot of older people who find themselves very alone, especially in our Latin American community. Por esta razón, con todo respeto, se apreciaría mucho si se consideraran fondos para este tipo de centro, porque será de mucho beneficio para los actuales adultos y los futuros que le seguimos. For this reason, I respectfully request that you consider funding for this funding for this kind of center because it would be a great benefit for today's seniors and also for those of us who are going to be the future's seniors. Hoy por ellos, mañana por nosotros. Muchas gracias por su atención. Buenas noches. Today for them, tomorrow for us. Many thanks. Good evening. Thank you for your testimony. Gracias por su testimonio. Our next speaker this evening is Christy Daphnis. 
<clears throat> Good evening. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify, uh, council members. Um, <clears throat> I'm testifying on behalf of the Pedestrian, Bicycle, and Traffic Safety Advisory Committee that I chair. Um, I think I don't have to tell you how much uh, traffic is down, but fatalities are up across our country. I mean, across our county over the past year um, with uh, COVID-19. I'm here to ask for uh, just a few things or a few considerations. Um, I would like you all to consider either sustaining or increasing staffing levels for county employees who are engaged in Vision Zero activities, MCDOT staff, parks and recreation staff and, pro staff and programming, as well as um, staffing at the regional service centers. I think proper staffing of all of these four entities will help to allow for better communications, increased service le levels um, across our county, as well as continue, continued programming like our shared streets program being run out of the MCDOT, as well as parks and recreation programming um, like the open parkways um, and other educational campaigns that are necessary um, as we face this, this pandemic and kind of adjusting to the new normal. So um, I think increased staffing levels of these four entities will help the community to have access to better programming and amenities um, that can help our, our county and our residents cope with COVID-19 impacts and improve safety across the county. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Martha Ortiz. Señorita Martha Ortiz. Sí. Buenas noches, estimados miembros del Consejo. Good evening, honorable members of the council. Primero quiero agradecer la oportunidad que se me ha brindado de testificar ante ustedes. I want first to thank you for the opportunity that's been given to me to testify before you. Mi nombre es Marta Ortiz, vivo en este condado por muchos años. My name is Marta Ortiz and I've lived in this county for many years. Soy participante de las clases cívicas en Wheaton High School. I'm a participant in the civics classes at Wheaton High School. Y miembro del programa de identidad establecido en la escuela. And I'm a member of the program called Identity, established in the school. Quisiera que este tipo de programas que atiende a los estudiantes y apoya a las familias, sobre todo a los padres latinos. I would like these programs, which uh, deal with our students and serve our students, and they support the families, especially the Latin American families. Se expandieran desde las escuelas medias, porque personalmente considero que son de mucha ayuda. I'd like them to be expanded beyond the middle schools because, personally, I think that they're of great benefit for our community. El trabajo de identity es muy valioso para nuestros hijos y las familias. The, por the work that esa that razón quisiera se considere. Sigue, sigue. <laughs> okay. I'd like esa razón that, quisiera que se considere incrementar. Incrementar los fondos. Okay, uh, the, the work of identity, it's very valuable for our children and for families. For this reason, I would like more funding for... Para esta organización, para muchos padres y la comunidad sean beneficiados con sus servicios. For this organization, because many parents and the community are benefiting from its services. Agradezco su tiempo. Buenas noches. Thank you for your time. Good evening. Thank you for your testimony. Y gracias por su testimonio. Our next speaker this evening is Paulina Valis. Paulina Valis. Buenas sí. noches, estimados concejales. Good evening, dear council members. Quiero agradecer la oportunidad que se me ha brindado de testificar ante ustedes. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity that I've been given to testify before you. Mi nombre es Paulina Veliz. Soy residente de Germantown desde hace mucho tiempo. My name is Paulina Veliz and I've been a resident of Germantown for a long time. Quiero compartir con ustedes 
I'd like to share with you. Que soy sobreviviente de cáncer de seno y agradecer por todos los programas que ayudan a personas con este diagnóstico. I'd like to share with you that I'm a breast cancer survivor. And I'd like to thank you for all the programs that help persons with this diagnosis. Especialmente al programa Nueva Vida, que, me, acompañ que me acompañó desde los inicios con mi enfermedad. Especially for the program called Nueva Vida, or New Life, that was with me from the beginning of my illness. Por, es por esta razón, for this reason, Quiero pedirles que aumenten los fondos para este tipo de organizaciones. For this reason, I'd like to ask you to increase funding for this type of organization. Para que puedan brindar más ayuda a las mujeres latinas que necesitan de este servicio. So that they can provide, provide more help for Latin American women that need this service. Este es un diagnóstico que afecta a la persona y a su familia. This is a diagnosis that affects the person and the family. Donde se necesita mucho apoyo emocional, terapia familiar, y todo esto lo da esta organización. And this need, this necessitates a lot of emotional support, family therapy, and all this is provided by this organization. Sé que este tipo de cáncer se está atendiendo, pero deseo pedirles que el Departamento de Salud Incremente el mayor número de exámenes de mamografías. I know that this kind of cancer is being attended to, but I want to thank you. And I want to ask that the department, the health department, increase to the extent possible the number of mam mammography exams. Y que sean de fácil acceso para realizarlos. And that these be easily accessible so that they can be done. Será de mucho, de mucho beneficio para nuestra comunidad, sobre todo en las áreas donde se encuentra la mayor población de mujeres latinas. Yeah, this would be of much benefit for our community, especially in those areas where there's the greatest concentration of, of women, of Latin American women. Y de esta manera prevenir a tiempo el desarrollo de esta terrible enfermedad. And this would help us address in time uh, the largest number of uh, cases of this terrible disease. Muchas gracias. Buenas noches. Thank you and good evening. Thank you very much for your testimony. Muchas gracias por su testimonio. Our next speaker this evening is Ramada Diop. Ramada, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Good evening. My name is Ramada Dio, a resident of Silver Spring. I'm here to advocate for countywide free pre-kindergarten. As a mother of three children in Montgomery County, I have had firsthand experience with the impact that early childhood education can have on child development and preparation for kindergarten. When now my 19-year-old was a toddler, my family could not afford preschool. I chose to stay home and took him to libraries for story time and to playgrounds until he was ready for kindergarten. Nine years later, I had my second child. Thanks to a parent that I met at the park, I learned about the Silver Spring Judy Center. I started taking my second son there when he was about 11 months old until he was ready for pre-kindergarten. The difference between my two sons was remarkable. Through his experience at the Judy Center, my second son was more socialized, adapt, and prepared for pre-kindergarten. Although I organized play date for my first son and worked hard to provide him with preschool activity, my second son had a high quality early childhood experience at the Judy Center. And it was time, when it was time for my second son to enter kindergarten, he was very prepared. He recognized the letter of the alphabet, could have counted to 20, knew his shapes and color and more. To this and his social interaction at the Judy Center made him much more confident and enthusiastic than my first son when he was entering kindergarten. This also gave me the opportunity and desire to go back to school and further my education. I strongly believe that by having free universal pre-K, children who cannot afford a private preschool education would be more emotionally resilient and develop a love of learning at an early age, and also give them an opportunity for socialization that they will not otherwise have. It will also allow the parents to be able to go to work and provide for their family and contribute to the economy. 
investing in early childhood education will provide a boost for the community as a whole. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker this evening is Aneshal Miller. Aneshal, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you're ready. Good evening, President, Vice President, Council Members. I'm Anisha Miller. I reside in Burtonsville, Maryland, and currently hold a voucher. I work full time and I volunteer in my spare time in my community. Vouchers strengthen communities and vouchers protect low income renters. As we envision and identify services to rehabilitate how supportive services are implemented, help to restore the integrity of the program for all particularly residents who are deemed poor and have poor representation is needed for voucher holders like myself who would like to purchase a home. The amendments will help us reach a higher standard. As a resident in Montgomery County, Maryland, I have been, I've been a participant of the Section 8 housing in-house program and the housing choice voucher. I've signed up for about five times for the family self-sufficiency to purchase a home. Each and every course of action in good intention was derailed five times. Race issues within the black community need not only reforms, but clear and precise oversight by dealing with the issues of race when it prohibits participants in the program from accessing resources and information. Partner with businesses and organizations and founders with integrity who understand the priorities within the Housing Choice Voucher Program, specifically for black men and women and our families to better resources and strengthen the resources through partnerships that are transparent. Please support the amendments and resolutions for the housing production. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Jacob Newman. Mr. Newman, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin. Top of the morning council members. My name is Jacob Newman and I'm the Montgomery County Managing Director for Latin America Youth Center, Maryland Multicultural Youth Centers. I'd like to start by thanking you for your leadership and partnership. As many colleagues and community members have testified and you each know intimately, this last year has been devastating for our community. Job and housing loss, food insecurity, violence, racism, and the tolls of social isolation crippled our economy and well-being. Youth and families served by LAYC, often those most at the margins, have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Our staff have worked through countless challenges, trauma, and fatigue in service to our community. And we recognize that only through the collective response with fellow nonprofits, Montgomery County government, and the private sector, we were able to mitigate further hardship to residents. We also know that the pandemic is far from over, and in too many ways, the impact will be felt for years to come. As such, I present to you today in favor of the County Executive's proposed budget and the relevant areas which support our work with youth and families. First, we applaud the decision to preserve a maintenance of efforts and existing community grants. As detailed in my written submission, funding for three LAYC community grants supports mentoring, workforce development, and mental health. We would also like to advocate for continued funding for DHHS, Department of Environmental Protection, and the Collaboration Council to work with youth and families. Across three distinct projects, LAYC staff worked to pivot all education and workforce programs to virtual learning and participation over a single weekend. It was so successful that we were actually able to increase our enrollment in academics by over 100%, and since July alone, have had 19 youth earn their GED credential. I could say a lot about case management, outreach, food delivery, technology support, emergency rental assistance, over $37,000 privately raised going directly to Montgomery County, residents at risk of homelessness, but I know that the time is waning. I do want to appreciate the increased funding for the Rainscapes program with DEP and advocate for increased funding with our beloved Montgomery Parks. In closing, I'll put on my nonprofit Montgomery board vice chair hat for a request. Nonprofits have been recognized and lauded as the nimble partners of government during this year of crisis. With deep roots in communities, we have risen to every call over and again. However, our contracts have no, had no increases last year, nor do our employees have step benefits. 
uh, step raises. I ask if we are truly seen as partners in the extension of county government as we are serving those residents most in need, and they, along with our own staff, are majority of people of color, would this not also be an issue of equity? Recognizing the challenging budget decisions you all have before you, we respectfully request that the council will confirm the total 3% increase across all department contracts. And Thanks for the opportunity to testify in your endurance you. in this budget process. Thank you very much. Our next speaker this evening is Diana Montalvo. Senorita Diana Montalvo, por favor. Puede dar su testimonio. Eh, quítase el mudo. Prenda. Yeah. Exacto. Okay. Ok. Buenas noches, presidente del Consejo Tom Hackers, vicepresidente Gabe Albornoz y demás miembros. Good evening, Council President Tom Hucker, Vice President Gabe Albornoz and the other members. Es para mí un honor estar frente a ustedes y agradezco la oportunidad que se me ha brindado. It's an honor for me to be before you and I appreciate the opportunity that has been given to me. My name, mi nombre es Diana Montalvo, soy residente de la ciudad de Rodville por mucho tiempo. My name is Diana Montalvo, and I've been a long, and I'm a longtime resident of the city of Rockville. Quisiera pedirles que se considere ampliar los servicios de salud mental a nuestra comunidad latina. I'd like to ask you to consider increasing mental health services to our Latin American community. Que está sufriendo mucho de depresión y ansiedad debido a todo lo que ha generado la pandemia del COVID-19. The community is suffering a lot. Uh, from depression and anxiety as a result of all that has been generated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Actualmente, para obtener una cita con un profesional en esta área, existe una lista de espera muy grande. Currently, there's a very long waiting list to obtain an appointment with a, a professional in this field. Considero que si hay más servicios, se reducirá el tiempo de espera y la atención será más oportuna y eficiente. I think that if there were more services, there would be a reduction in the wait time and this, the attention given to the person would be more timely and efficient. También quisiera que al momento de contratar profesionales de salud mental, se contemplara que sea personal bilingüe, culturalmente competente. I also ask that at the point when you are hiring uh, professionals in this field, um, that you that you seek out professionals, mental health professionals that are bilingual and that are culturally competent. Nuevamente, muchas gracias por su atención. Again, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your testimony. Muchas gracias por su testimonio. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is Olympia Alvarez. Buenas noches, miembros del consejo. Mi nombre es Olimpia Álvarez y vivo en los apartamentos Welchester West en Silver Spring. Good evening again. Uh, my name is Olimpia Álvarez and I live in the Westchester West Apartments, uh, of, in the Welchester West Apartments in Silver Spring. Vengo en nombre de un grupo de madres de familia de mi comunidad, ya que estamos preocupadas por el bienestar de nuestros seres queridos. I'm here as a member of a group of mothers in my community because we're worried about the welfare of our dear ones, our, care, our dear ones. Desde hace dos años hemos notado un incremento considerable de la delincuencia en nuestro vecindario. Personas ajenas a la comunidad vienen a la zona a hacer sus fechorías. For the last two years, we've noticed a considerable growth in delinquency in our neighborhood. People from outside of our community are coming to the zone and, and doing harm. Lo hemos denunciado, pero no ha cambiado nada. Por ejemplo, hace algunos meses asesinaron a un individuo cerca de las oficinas de los apartamentos y desde entonces hay más temor y desconfianza en salir a caminar en el vecindario. We've reported these things, uh, but it doesn't, it hasn't changed at all. For example, a few months ago, they actually assassinated, they killed an individual near the offices of our apartments. And since then, there's been more fear and distrust in going outside or walking around the neighborhood. Quisiéramos que se asignen más fondos para contratar oficiales de la policía bilingües que vigilen esta área y así sentirnos más seguras. We would like to be 
to, we'd like there to be more funds assigned to hiring bilingual police officers that that uh, monitor this area, and that way we would feel more safe. También en la parte posterior de los apartamentos hay un área verde y quisiéramos pedirles por favor se consideren la remodelación de este lugar para que nuestros hijos puedan jugar con tranquilidad y seguridad. Sería oh. genial que instalen juegos para niños e iluminación ya que no existen actualmente. Also in the back area behind the apartments there's a green area and we would like please consider uh, remodeling this area so that our children can play there safely and and uh, peacefully. It would be really great if uh, playground equipment was installed and some lighting because there's none of that. Agradezco su atención. Muy buenas noches. I appreciate your attention. Good evening. Thank you for your testimony. Gracias por su testimonio. Our next speaker this evening is Lisa Rother. Ms. Rother, you have two minutes. You may begin when you're ready. Uh, good evening. Yes, my name is Lisa Rother, and um, I am retired. I was a city planner for the city of Rockville and for Montgomery County for many years, and I really wanted to... Um, come here tonight to testify on the budget to talk about my retirement time and my plans were originally to travel to many places during my first year of uh, retirement but instead I've been traveling to many many facilities uh, in the county that the parks department runs and I am so impressed with every single one of them. Um, I ride my bike every weekend on the closed beach drive. I walk several times a week at Brookside Gardens. It's provided a way to spend some time with my friends and family that is not, you know, uh, COVID unhappy. Um, Leo, my golden doodle and I really applaud the dog parks in the community. Um, the new Dewey Road dog park, if you haven't been there, you should go. It's a very happy, wonderful place. And I think its design is terrific. And what I notice is not only the dog park is well used, but the entire park. Uh, there's always families and children and people playing hockey there. There's a hockey rink. It's, it's just fabulous. Um, and the other thing uh, that I would like to say is I, I use the trails a lot, um, both in Wheaton Regional. Um, and this morning I was walking with my dog and uh, we came across uh, a therapeutic riding program uh, with five young adults uh, on horses being led through the park. And it's, it's just wonderful, all the different things that I learn and see when I'm out in the park. So I guess my bottom line is uh, approval of as much money as possible for the park and planning and the parks department um, is, is really what I would encourage. I, I have to say I lost 70 pounds since I retired and I think a lot of it is due to the parks and all my exercise. So I have uh, one other note uh, too actually. Um, I am an affordable housing advocate and I am the vice chair of MHP's board and I really applaud all the money that uh, the county has been putting into with the support of the council, uh, affordable housing funds for the nonprofits who can uh, create and serve and safe affordable housing. Um, and the rental assistance program also, as much as you all can put into that, I think is incredibly important for both the landlords and the tenants uh, to be able to climb back out of this hole that COVID has created for us. Thank you. And, uh, Your time is up. I really appreciate oh, it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker tonight is Juanita Rogers. Ms. Rogers, you have two minutes for your, for your testimony and you may begin as soon as you're ready. Good evening, President Hooker and members of the County Council. My name is Juanita Rogers and I co-chair the Victim Services Advisory Board. The impact of the pandemic on victim services provided by HHS Trauma Services, which includes the Victim Assistance and Sexual Assault Program and the Abused Person Program, requires attention. For these programs, the demand for help from victim from crime victims almost doubled when comparing 2019 and 2020 intake data. The board suspects this percentage difference in demand has grown since then with individuals experiencing continued challenges from the COVID-19 pandemic. The severity of the cases have become more critical with an increase in homicides, hate crimes, domestic violence, sexual violence, and more reports of strangulations. 
as facilities such as safe passages and the BAK shelter are slowly building back capacity with safe distancing, the staff are preparing for an even greater need for assistance. The increase in demand tracks closely to Montgomery County police reports. In late 2020, the homicide rate went up 167% compared to the same time in 2019. There was a 10.7% increase in rapes as well. Already in 2021, Chief Jones has labeled the significant increase in homicides as a disturbing trend, with seven homicides in January, which is the most ever in one month. There has also been a 40% jump in armed robberies. Enhancing the staffing levels and resources for HHS trauma services has been a priority for the board. The pandemic has just exacerbated this need. The board will continue to advocate for increased staffing levels to meet the needs of the community. With so much COVID relief spending, our request during the pandemic has been that you at least maintain the resources for these programs. We appreciate that County Executive Elbridge has done so in his budget, and we request that the County Council also maintain these resources. Looking to the future, we urge you to closely examine the preparedness of the county to provide a multidisciplinary and multi-agency approach to better serve victims of crime. Additionally, housing needs for victims of domestic violence is likely to become even more urgent as a result of the pandemic. Our board has been advocating for both one-year bridge housing with case management services, as well as improved access to permanent housing. Bridge housing was established until lead was discovered, requiring the properties to be shut down in the past. Exactly. We kindly ask the County Council to address the need for housing. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Shane Rock. Mr. Rock, you will have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you're ready. Good evening. I am Shane Rock, CEO of the Jewish Council for the Aging of Greater Washington. The JCA Esc Escorted Transportation Program helps Montgomery County residents aged 50 or older with household in incomes of less than $40,000 per year and who need an escort while traveling. From fiscal year 2014 through 2019, JCA Escorted Transportation provide an average of more than 600 escorted rides per year. Because of the impact of COVID-19, DHHS reduced the budget for JCA Escorted Transportation by more than one third last fall. The county executive has proposed keeping the budget at this reduced amount for fiscal year 22. As older adults become vaccinated, we are seeing a significant increase in demand for escorted transportation trips. The number of rides has doubled from 50 for July through September to 100 for January through March. The seniors using this service have low incomes, require an escort to accompany them, and have no other viable means of travel to medical appointments, to shop for groceries, or to engage in other life activities. Escorted transportation is vital service to relieve their isolation and connect them to the vibrant life of this county. Under the county executive's proposed 20 fiscal year 22 budget, we estimate we will run out of funding to provide escorted rides by March of 2022. We believe that the county executive's fiscal year 22 budget did not anticipate that the needs for escorted transportation would return to the pre-pandemic levels by the beginning of the fiscal year. We respectfully ask that the County Council add $45,000 to restore the budget to its pre-reduction amount. Restoring this funding will allow us to meet the projected escorted transportation needs of seniors in our community who would otherwise be homebound. We join our peers in supporting Nonprofit Montgomery's call for a 3% increase in nonprofit contracts. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Paul Meyer. Mr. Meyer, you may begin your testimony when you're ready and you will have two minutes. Hello, my name is Paul Meyer and I live in Silver Spring with my wife and our 21 month old son. Tonight, I'm testifying in support of Montgomery Parks operating and capital budgets. The county parks have kept my family and I sane and safe during the COVID-19 pandemic. But there's one park in particular that I would like to bring attention to. This park did more than, more than just keep us safe. This park transformed an entire neighborhood. Acorn Park was a historic but little used pocket park in South Silver Spring. However, Thanks to the cooperation and innovative thinking of MCDOT and Montgomery Parks, one block of Newell Street was open to people, doubling the size of Acorn Park. 
Montgomery Park's activation team sprung into action, providing picnic tables and street, street trees for the space. This, in combination with the Picnic in the Parks program, turned a lifeless block into South Silver Springs' first neighborhood gathering spot. Adults could gather on the picnic tables and grab beers from local restaurants, while the rest of the street turned into a play street for children to ride bikes or just run around. Acorn Park itself also got the most use I've seen in the seven years that I've lived in the neighborhood. For example, my son now loves to run into the steps of the original Silver Spring, um, now that we can actually use the space. It's not an exaggeration to say that Montgomery Parks changed the future of the South Silver Spring neighborhood. For that, I ask that Montgomery Parks operating and capital budgets be fully funded. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Our next speaker this evening is Mariette Gomga. Ms. Gomga, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Hello, my name is Marianne Gunga and I'm living in Gettysburg. I'm here to ask the county council member to create more daycare. It will be helpful for parents like me who struggle with childcare every day. I'm a mother with three children who cannot plan nothing like a full-time job because of children. My three years old is at home. The center he used to go to has age limit and many families in the community are facing the same issue. That is the reason more daycare will be less stressful for parents. Community need child care center which, which go uh, from age zero to age uh, that children are ready to go to school. Many families will be doing better and will be able to plan. It will give parents an opportunity to work and maybe go to school to improve their life and not need public benefit. We also need to focus on helping the community access information. Daycare exists in the community, but most of information is available online on the internet. Many families do not have the right program due to the lack of knowledge. Some people do not know how to find information on the computer. Others do not even have internet because of lack of financial means. Besides computer, if we can uh, add another way to have information, it will be better for those who are in need of childcare. The goal is to have a happy community more decay and more information I need in the community that will be helpful to move forward with their life. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. President, that wraps up the speakers for this evening's public hearing. Thank you so much, Susan. And thanks to all of our uh, speakers tonight. We heard a lot of really powerful testimony and we're gonna take it all into consideration as we put together the budget. Thank you all so much. We'll see you again soon. Stay in touch.